Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the Fair Compare weekly video podcast. My name is Rick Sini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fair Compare. We've got several topics on our vi video cast today to talk about. One of them is in the area of too big to fly. That keeps cropping up uh, every uh, six to eight months right now. We see those stories that are coming out. We also have some new news about United Airlines, a little bit of a shakeup there with United Airlines, as well as talking a little bit about the holiday deal zone. Enjoy Joining me today to uh, cover these topics is our editor from the site at sharecompare.com, Ann McDermott. Hey, Ann. Hey, Rick. Well, we have a lot to talk about today, so why don't we jump right in? And yeah, it sounds like fun. I, you know, I hear from a lot of people that say, you know, am I too big to fly? Am I going to be embarrassed by the airline? And I guess the short answer is no, you're not too big to fly, but the airlines might embarrass you if you don't be proactive. Yeah, no, there, there's clearly, um, you know, every flight's different, every airline's different. Um, you know, in theory, they would love people that are quote unquote big, too big to fly. And I, I'm not sure what kind of standard there is for that because it appears to be only in the eyes of the flight attendant or the gate agent in some cases. Um, but they would prefer people buy two tickets. In some cases, they'll refund the second ticket. A lot of people aren't incentivized to do that. So they buy one ticket and then, uh, and that's where we get into some of these things that, that run in. And, and there's a, you know, we've got Uzbekistan airlines <laughs> weighing in on their passengers and, and baggage. Uh, so Wait. tell us a little bit about that, Ann. Well, and this has been making the news in the past uh, a few months. Uh, the, as you pointed out, Uzbekistan Airlines, they are weighing their passengers now. They're not exactly saying why, but they're, they're saying they're weighing the passengers with uh, their baggage. It's, it's an experimental thing. I certainly hope it does not spread to other airlines. And so far, the only other airline we've heard of that does uh, passenger weights is Samoa Air. Uh, and they, right. that's a very tiny airline. They only have three planes and the biggest plane only holds nine people. So I guess you'd be, you know, it'll be nice and chummy when you're all embarrassed together. But right. with well, yeah, I mean, Samoa, yeah. that, that they've got a wrinkle. They, you, you pay by the pound. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's always been sort of the nuclear option that we've talked about here in the United States. If you actually had to step up on a scale before and pay by the pound as you were to enter a particular aircraft. Um, I mean, let's face it, um, in general, the folks in the United States aren't getting any skinnier and the planes aren't getting any bigger. At least, well, the planes might be getting a little bit bigger, but the seats aren't getting any bigger. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you what I find most confusing is the airline's and they all say roughly the same thing. This is how you know if you should buy a second seat. And I'm going to read this here. Uh, this is from Delta, but others actually have very similar, similar language. Yeah. It says most airlines say if you are unable to sit in your seat without encroaching into the seat next to you while the armrest is down, you must buy a second seat. But, you know, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I've seen this happen quite a bit on aircraft and I think it's a little bit of a free for all. Who's in, who, who in their right mind is going to buy two seats when it costs twice as much if they don't think that they have to? I know that some of the airlines do refund some of that. Well, one airline does that, that we're aware of. Uh, I've only heard of uh, Southwest doing this, but uh, also with them, you, you can go online or pick up the phone and right. talk to an agent and that's probably smarter. So you can, you know, make sure they understand the situation so that the two seats can be together and, uh, but you have to pay for it, but then you fill out a form for a refund and, uh, you know, it sounds, sounds like a very good deal and something, you know, you do consider. Right. No. I, and again, I think, again, this is one of those things where it, it's uncomfortable for everybody. It's uncomfortable for the person. It's uncomfortable for the passengers. It probably is uncomfortable for the flight attendants and the gate agents. Some are probably more comfortable with being, you know, um, the judge and jury than others. <laughs> but uh, certainly this is an area that, uh, you know, we've weighed in several times. Uh, I guess that, that's just sort of... <laughs> I'm not sure I should have said that uh, several times on our ABC news columns in this particular area. And it looks like it's still going to stay into the forefront. So moving on to sort of the next topic, um, 
you know, it's it's uh, been kind of a, a strange month uh, with United Airlines, with the CEO stepping down very abruptly after what appears to be a, a scandal related to, and, you know, semi-connected to uh, the Port Authority of, from New Jersey and New York and a new CEO coming in and maybe ushering in a new era. Well, and the uh, the new CEO, uh, Oscar Munoz, uh, has written a letter to employees, which in which you know who knows uh, what it really means, but he's asking for employee input. He he really wants to know what's going on, what's going wrong. Of course, I I suppose he could have some of his passengers. They've had a <laughs> they've, they've had a lot of problems um, with their uh, the website for people trying you know website, trying to buy their, tickets and their loyalty system, their upgrades. Um, yeah. I mean, if you got on Flyer Talk, it's been sort of a constant battle. You know, the the funny thing about it is, is that a, a lot of business travelers had a love affair with Continental Airlines, um, yeah. and then this the merger with United occurred, and and really, to be honest, a huge amount of Continental uh, management team made it over to United, and somehow that didn't translate into the new brand. I know that the livery looks more like Continental, but the name is United, and it certainly didn't have the best of reputations. They had lots of, uh, I guess, growing pains and merger pains as part of that, which caused some of the issues to occur. I will say, every time I run into a, you know, a United employee, a gate agent, or a you know, somebody right. at the ticket sales or something, they're great. They're really great. They're smart. They're knowledgeable. But it seems as though somehow, you know, maybe management hasn't been paying as much attention to their people on the ground who really know what's going on. And it sounds like at least steps are being made to to sort of turn this around. I hope so. I, I took a United flight last week and everything ran smoothly. The reason I know that is I don't remember it too much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's only the times Best that time. I have a rough time. Yeah. That, that, that you remember stuff. And that's something they're going to certainly want to work on as they have a, a new management team there. And lastly, on our list today for the video podcast yeah. is uh, one of our favorite older topics, <clears throat> which is the holiday deal zone. And uh, let's, let's talk about what's left of the deal zone. We had a deal zone, uh, you know, we were talking about a couple months ago, and then uh, some of that's been pared away as we're getting closer to the end of the year. Right. Well, there still are, uh, as, as you pointed out, there's a couple of uh, excellent deal zones. I'm already seeing it in, in sales and things like that. Sure. Um, I, I Just in shorthand terms, I like to call it the November and the December uh, deal zone, but it's sort of like a sandwich around Thanksgiving travel. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Which is it the is. most. It's ex- the first, yeah, the first three weeks in November and the first two weeks in December sandwiched around that one painful week. Yeah. It, and I, I guess I guess it's just obvious. I mean, demand has got to nosedive because everybody knows they've got to travel for Thanksgiving or the mom will kill you. So these other weeks, nobody's flying. And that's where the deals are. It was funny today. I was actually doing a, an interview in Canada and uh, just out of road, I was like, and let's talk about Thanksgiving. <laughs> and they're like, oh, sorry, we don't do Thanksgiving up here. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Okay. So it's not sandwiched around Thanksgiving. They actually do it uh, several weeks before that. They, they do honor pilgrims. They just not the same ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, we have we get questions from customers all the time. One of the one of the things they're always asking you about, of course, is sure, Thanksgiving yeah. and when to buy. And I know you would say, well, it's uh, almost October by now, but we yeah. do we have some we have some brand new questions. Uh, I don't know if how familiar you are with these particular miles programs, but Sally Ann wants to know. Well, let me read it. She says, I am a 1K member on United, but I have been severely upset with them. Unfortunately, she doesn't tell us why, because that would be an interesting story. (laughs) But she says, I've heard that I can transfer to Delta and get the same status and get to keep uh, the miles and fly them. Is this true? And how do I do this? Yeah. So to Sally, there each of the airlines, the three remaining legacy airlines, American, Delta and United, have a form of uh, elite challenging in. So hmm. they want your business. If you're an elite traveler, you can challenge. And certainly you're not going to be able to transfer your United miles over to Delta, your actual miles that are in your United account. But you may be you may be able to uh, challenge in for elite status. You can say, hey, you know what? I'm a United customer. Miss uh, Delta, 
I would really like to challenge in at the same level. In that case, it would be one of the medallion levels. She's at one of the highest levels at United. Uh, I believe 1K is just below global entry, which is the highest. Um, I think 1K is 100,000 miles, if I remember correctly. I, I live in Dallas, so American is the one I'm mostly familiar right. with. Uh, but um, the, they, you can basically challenge in. On American, she can challenge in as a platinum, for example. And typically that challenge includes something where you have to travel some number of miles in order to immediately get status. In many cases, they'll give you the status straight away. Um, God, I've been spending too much time in the UK. I don't want to stay straight away. Um, <laughs> right away. And, um, and so you'll get that, you'll get your status right away with them. That means you'll get all the benefits of that. But after a month or two, depending on what the time frame is, you'll have to fly a certain number of miles with that airline in order to keep that status. But she loses her United miles. It sounds she like. doesn't use lose them. They stay in her United account. She can redeem them on United in the normal way. But okay. uh, United's certainly not going to let her transfer it over to Delta. This is why some people like to use um, uh, hotel credit cards that have transfer capability to do a lot of their mileage accumulation with credit cards. Because in that case, it's on your hotel credit card, and then they allow you to transfer it to whichever airline you'd like, Ooh. be it United or Delta, for example. That's smart. Okay. Leo from Gainesville has a question. He says, I'm thinking about going to the Olympics next year in Rio. And I say, good for you, Leo. <laughs> Take me. Any advice on how to get there without paying a fortune? Yeah, you know, there's a couple different things there. I mean, you can start to buy tickets about 11 months before departure. And you can imagine you That's know, the soon. Olympic... Yeah. So you can you can actually do it almost a year in advance, not quite a year in advance. OK, um, so it doesn't hurt to start looking at that time frame. Certainly, if you ha if you're wanting to redeem miles or points or whichever program you're in, uh, that's something you might want to look at. Probably you won't be able to do it at the lower levels, but at the higher levels, you may be able to redeem your points or miles if you have enough. As far as actually paying for the tickets, um, you know, the Olympics is a very long time frame. I believe it's two and a half, almost three weeks long. Something like that, yeah. So you'll the, the key there is, you know, whether or not you want to make it to the opening and closing ceremony. So if you go halfway into the Olympics, for example, uh, assuming you can get tickets or that you're going to scalp tickets or something to get in, um, that's usually your best bet. So what you want to do is, you know, go during the Olympics. But if you want to catch the opening and closing ceremonies, that's where you see the ticket prices jump dramatically a few days before the Olympics start and right after the day after the Olympics end. So the question is, can you avoid those particular days in that particular instance? Um, certainly, there's some travel agents that specialize in South American travel. Some of them have some discounting. I don't expect a lot of discounting. I do expect to see some capacity addition, at least for that three weeks, the three or four weeks surrounding the Olympics. Maybe if they add capacity, depending on when they do it, Will it be six months ahead of time? Will it be four months ahead of time, mm -hmm. for example? Mm -hmm. But in general, you want to start shopping about five months ahead of time. But if you see a great ticket at the 11th month mark, and, and he didn't say where he was from. Oh, he's in Gainesville. Yeah. I'm assuming that's in the, the Florida version of Gainesville because we have one here in Texas as well. <laughs> but uh, assuming it's either Texas or Florida, um, typically you'd want to start looking about five months ahead. I would check at the 11 month mark, uh, kick the tires, see which all the airlines that are flying in there. You could actually fly into, you know, uh, one of the two yeah. big cities there, Rio or Sao Paulo. From Sao Paulo, you can uh, either take a low cost airline or some other ground transportation. So uh, there's some options there. You just have to shop and pick sort of the right day. It, this is sort of like shopping for the holidays. There's never really a good deal. It's just better bad deals. Well, I like the fact that he's got so much time to plan this because yeah. he can really, uh, you know, experiment. Like maybe if he's only interested in, say, the opening ceremony, he could make, a, you know, a, a fun South American trip, maybe come two weeks before that and uh, or a week and a half or whatever, and then stay for the opening ceremony and just catch a couple of the early things or do the same thing <laughs> in reverse, like get there right before the, the closing ceremony and then, and then hang out for out. an extra few days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Stretch out your trip a little bit. 
Yeah, either I way. think that's the best bet. That's the best bet for folks is to stretch it out a little bit, avoid the, those busy times and, and you'll get a decent deal, not a great deal. And, and you, you know, part of this too, is if you're going, it's about getting tickets as well. I know there's a lot of things that are free and sort of the periphery of stuff, but you're going to probably want tickets to certain things. And that's an area uh, that we'll have to wait for a couple other articles as we get closer to the Olympics. Yeah. And he should probably start thinking about hotels too, if he's not staying with friends or anything like that. Yeah. It was a little different from the world. World Cup in Brazil a, a while back, um, you know, when it ha- was in different cities, it was a yeah. little easier to get around. This is going to be a concentrated worldwide, you know, three week invasion <laughs> of Brazil. So it's going to be a little more difficult to find a good deal. I bet he will have a good time no matter no matter how he works it, but he's got time. I wish That's I could. Great. I'm we're, my wife and I are discussing if we want to do this or not. So we're, we're still in the debate stage at the moment. I'd love to do it. Well, um, I just got back from a, a, a pretty long trip and it was, uh, you know, you planning is key, you know, f- planning what you're going to wear, what you're going to pack, uh, precisely what you want to see. All that is, uh, you know, we've, we've written lots of articles on things like that uh, on Fair Compare. But, uh, you know, the more the more you can foresee and also understand that, you right. know, stuff's going to happen you know, bags will get roll lost with maybe. it. Yeah, <laughs> you got to be able to roll with it. With it. Roll with it. No, it happens all the time. If you don't roll with it, you, I mean, why take a multi thousand dollar trip and, and have bad taste in your mouth? There's no sense in that. So, I mean, you can't, like you said, you, you can't anticipate everything that's going to happen, but if you do it enough times, read some articles from people like us that have, have done this many times and actually stumbled, uh, stubbed their toe many times <laughs> and can give you a few tips on how not to stub your toe. And, and, uh, you know, the fun, one part of it is you, you plan everything, make sure you know where all your transportation is. And then once you get there, hang out with the locals, right? That's the key. That's the fun part of things as well. Uh, I know you want to mention the adventurist. That's a, no, a absolutely. So, so folks out there that haven't been able uh, to take a look, we have a brand new native app that's out there. I'm really super stoked about uh, the new Adventurist app. It's a mashup between events and tourists. Uh, just go out to the App Store or Google Play, type in Fair Compare, and download the Adventurist app. It has, I think, well, it has many dozen different locations around the world, talks about them, how to get airfare to them, uh, beautiful, stunning imagery, uh, and some fun stuff to do some shopping there. And uh, we'll have a an update to that app here in the next month or so that'll actually allow you to do all sorts of uh, clever things as well. So look for that first release of Adventurous, download it, and uh, look for that next release coming up right behind it so you can get alerts and a variety of other things on your native apps. And you can uh, subscribe to these podcasts, excuse me, these video podcasts and regular podcasts at iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other platforms. Exactly. Many of which I have never heard of in my life, but I'm sure they are excellent, <laughs> excellent platforms. Every day, my 15 year old comes home and I learn something more about the, I know. the, the millennial generation and apps on phones. So uh, I'm, I'm learning every day. It's pretty amazing. So, Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Ed. 